today I will be providing the overview for the Sunday School lesson today, which is entitled Facing the Impossible, and it's coming from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. And I'll start by reading the scriptures, um, verses 15 through 21. And it reads from the New Revised Standard Version. The Lord your God will raise, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of, the, of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? And that's verse 21. And so from there, I give you a brief overview of, of what's happening in the Bible at this point. So at this point, um, Moses has been with the Israelites, leading them to the promised land for 40 years. And now it's about to be a change of leadership. So you can imagine if I've been with somebody for 40 years and not a normal 40 years, these people have escaped slavery and went to the promised land and they are, they are about to get a new leader. So that is scary because Moses at this point, he has provided them with food, water, fire, all the basic necessities through through God, of course. He has spoken to God directly and and came back to give them the word of, of, you know, of God and the commands of the Lord to them. And so it's a lot of trust they put in Moses at this point. And... Um, he is held in very high esteem, higher than any priest or pastor or anything. You know, he's the prophet. He's speaking to God and telling us what's going to happen in the future. And um, so now you mean tell these people that it's about to be a new leader. And the first question they want to know is, how I know, how do we know that this person is really going to be speaking to God and what he tells us is going to be of God? So that's, that's their main concern because they want that kind of assurance. And to that, the future is like a very, very delicate thing, right? It's very delicate in the sense that um, we don't know what the future holds at all. We don't know. And when someone gives us just a snippet, a piece of what's going to happen in the future, it almost kind of assures us if it's a good thing, give us kind of a spirit of assurance or it, get, or it tells us that we need to get prepared, you know, need to be prepared for what's going to come and what I need to do to, make, to so I can be ready when a bad thing comes. And I'll give you an example. So in Isaiah, I, in Isaiah, he was the major prophet who basically gave um, the people the prophet that a savior, a messiah would come. And he would be born of man, and you know, but he would be the the Christ, you know, the Messiah. And so that gave us assurance. It was like, yes, it is going to be the Savior, you know, who's going to cleanse all the sins. We won't have to go through all these steps, and we will, you know, be redeemed through him. So that was assurance. But now we have this prophecy from the Bible that the world will end at some point, and it will not be a pretty sight right and so um we have like parity. we're getting ready for that and trying to get others ready for that so that's what that's the importance of a prophet because the future is so delicate and we don't know it but if we have like a piece of it or what will come to pass we can be ready or gives us assurance right so a big thing a big problem in the bible is false prophets and what I've learned that is if the Bible mentions something a lot, 
it's a problem. It's like a pro- bigger problem than we can imagine. And I learned that a lot in a lot of different ways, but I'm going to go into that. But if, the, if I mention something a lot, then he trying to make sure that we know it because it's a lot to, to be wary of, right? So the big issue is like, how can we recognize a word that that the Lord has not spoken? And before I read verse 22, when, when, he point, when Moses points out how you can do that, I want to go into how one of the ways I think or you can you can do that. So I would argue that you have to have your own personal relationship with the Lord. Because as you fortify, strengthen your relationship with with your personal relationship with God, he would sharpen, first of all, sharpen your spirit of discernment. So you'll be able to know when people are not necessarily true or not necessarily honest and not of like a false private base. You will be able to discern that with the spirit of discernment that God will give you as you strengthen your relationship. And also, when you have this relationship with God, a strong relationship with God, God can give you your own prophecies. Now, I'm not saying he, you will become a prophet, but he can give you an, an assurance of your own future. And so, if a prophet doesn't, or a prophet negates what you already know through your own personal relationship with the Lord that He has told you, that's number one. Like, oh, you're not right because Lord already told me what's gonna happen, you know, because I have my own relationship with the Lord. So, I was well, of course, strengthen your relationship with God so you can get, so you can get your spirit of discernment sharpened so you can be able to decipher and distinguish when a false prophet is a false prophet and when a true prophet is a true prophet and you and god will give you your own like prophecies your personal prophecies and what will come to pass for your personal future through their like personal connection with the lord verse 22 of deuteronomy 18 tells us like a very obvious way though moses says if a prophet speaks in the name of the lord but the thing does not take place or prove true. It is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. And presumptuous just means they have spoken freely and taken liberties, basically, about this prophecy. It's not ordained by God. It's not from God. But it's something they have concocted in their own minds, right? And so that is number one. If they say something and it doesn't come to pass, false prophet i mean easy right and so i also want to mention some other scriptures um about false prophecies and like i said if it's it's mentioned a lot in the bible and it's mentioned in the old testament and new testament so that gives us a good key like oh this is an age-old problem that people have been falsely prophesying in the name of the lord and god wants us to to know that and to know when we can see and know you know those differences right and so the book gives us titus 1 6 and you can read it on your own and that's specifically talking about a bishop but the book relates bishop elders and prophets as the same thing but i want to read to you verse i mean matthew chapter 7 verses 15 through 20 and we know this scripture a lot but i'll read it now okay verse 15 of matthew 7 Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. And we know that scripture very well by their fruits. You should know you should know a tree by the fruit it bears. So, in the most literal sense, you have a lemon tree. And a lemon tree is healthy on the inside. It's going to bear healthy lemons. You have a lemon tree that has parasites or worms or bacteria um the fruit that it bears will not be healthy and that's the same thing the inside of us 
will manifest on the outside of us through our words, through our walk, the way we do things, our integrity, the people we hang around, you know, it will manifest and you will be able to see and know is this person real, true of the Lord, or are they a false prophet? And so just, you know, think about that in the week. And what are people and think about what people decipher you as. When they see your fruits, they think, oh, that's a good tree. Or do they see a bad tree? And they see a bad tree, they need to work on that. We all need to work on that, right? But if they see a good tree, that's good. And keep working on being a great tree. <laughs> all right, thank you. Amen, amen. God is so good and kind to us. Ain't that right? Amen, amen. And it's a blessing to be here in the house of the Lord one more time. Uh, we're in a, a little bit different setting from last last year, I can say. Uh, but it's a good one. Amen. I see all of God's children. Amen. And he has a word for each and every one of us on this first Sunday morning. Amen. Amen, amen. And, uh, all of this bright sun, hey, it got to put a smile on your face, ain't it right? Yeah. Amen, amen. I know one thing, it's good to be able to just breathe this fresh air that God has allowed for us, ain't that right? Yeah. Amen, amen. And uh, good to be able to see, good to be able to walk around, and uh, strength and health. And uh, it's, it's just a good thing, amen, to be living today. Amen. And, uh, We've seen some weather that uh, shut us down. You know, a lot of people say they weren't going to quarantine, but God has his way, don't it? Amen. He has his way. Amen. Uh, for a whole week there, we was, most of us were shut in. Couldn't even get out. Amen. But uh, I enjoyed it. I didn't have to work that week, so I, I took it as a vacation. Amen. To be, uh, be able to share some time with my family. But if you have your Bibles today, and I know you do, God has a word from us from the book of Matthew today. Matthew, the 6th chapter, I'm going to be reading it here in verses 14 and verses 15. Verses 14 and 15. And I want you to put a pen at Matthew chapter 18. Verses 21 and 22. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Y'all had to excuse the captain. There's a little breeze under here. This is how it reads in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 14, it says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now let's go to verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. And this is how it reads. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. Right. We're going to talk to you just for a little while today about God's gold standard of forgiveness. All right. All right. God's gold standard of forgiveness. All right. and I just want to let you all know today that uh, this is going to be one of a, a series of forgiveness this month of God's God's gold standard of forgiveness. So first of all, let us talk a little bit about what forgiveness means. What forgiveness means. If we go back to the root word, forgive, it means to cease 
to feel resentment against another. It also means to pardon. It also means to cancel a debt, to wipe the slate clean. Y'all hear what I said? To cease the feel of resentment against another, to pardon another, to cancel a debt, a debt, to wipe the slate clean. This is the definition of forgiveness. Amen? So it's been proven that it's, a, it's, it's, it's really impossible to live in this world in which we live in without getting hurt. Got to get a witness of that. You're going to get hurt sometime, ain't that right? Your feelings going to get hurt sometime. It's impossible to go on in this world without being offended sometimes. It's impossible also to live in this world without being misunderstood sometimes. To be lied to sometimes. And even sometimes being rejected, amen? But one of the key principles, I want y'all to write this down, one of the key principles, remember I, of living a victorious Christian life is understanding how to forgive those who have offended you in such ways. Y'all understand where I'm going with it? Yes, God wants us to know all about forgiveness here at Mount Moriah. He wants the world to know about forgiveness. Amen? Because that's a key principle in life. We have to understand that. And we have to keep in mind also that many times we ourselves have been the offender. Right. Can I say that again? That's right. That's right. There's been a lot of times, amen, that I have offended someone else. Right. Been a lot of times that I have treated somebody else wrongly, amen? Right. So you also have to look at your own self. Have to look at your own life, amen? Because you're not the one that's being offended sometimes. Sometimes you are the offender. So we had to keep that in mind. But Jesus instructed us, amen, over there in Matthew chapter 6, on how to pray. Y'all remember that, right? Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 and 12 says, And forgive us our debts. Okay. It don't stop there. It says, As we forgive our debtors. Y'all right. hear that? Yeah. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, forgive us of our sins. As we do, also forgive those who sin against us. Amen? Now this is a huge call right here. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the book, if you, if you find it, you let me know, tells me that this is going to be an easy task to do. But I know one thing for sure, God has placed a lot of emphasis on forgiveness in the Bible. And it must be done. Amen? It must be done. And for the record, if you want to find that uh, the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew chapter 6, verse verses 9 through 13 in your Bibles. Amen. Well, let us go there uh, to verse 15, Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to go there now, and I'm going to read and you hear it once again, uh, verses 14 and 15. It says, For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So there's a condition there, ain't that right? It says for if, whenever you see if, something, something else got to happen. So if you forgive men their trespasses, then God will also forgive us. We see the same thing now. So Jesus goes on in verse 15, he says, but if you forgive not men 
their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Amen? So it must be done, church. We, we have to forgive others, amen, in this life that we live here. It got to be done. Because Jesus goes on, he, he explains the benefit of forgiving those who sin against us. The benefit he gives us, ain't that right? If we forgive others, the benefit is that God is going to forgive us. Right. That's right. And he also gives the consequence. Verse 15 gives a consequence if we don't forgive others. Right. If we don't forgive others, God our Father would not forgive us. Okay, thank you, Y'all understand what's going on? Yes, sir. So basically, these verses are saying that the measure of forgiveness, y'all listen, the measure of forgiveness you show others is the measure of forgiveness God no. will show us. Amen? All right, all right. Yeah. This is God's gold standard of forgiveness church, there's a whole lot of unnecessary hurt and pain going on in the world today. A whole lot of hurt and pain going on around here today. Amen? Simply because of unforgiveness. And I don't use that word simply uh, lightly. Because as I said early, earlier, uh, it's it's not a hard task. It's not an easy task to do, amen? But it must be done. And the only way that we'll get this done, the only way that we can achieve forgiving others is that we have to lean and depend on God. That's where we get the strength from. Amen? Consider yourself as a, you may consider yourself as a forgiving person. But now you're facing, amen, uh, the difficulty of forgiving someone who's wrong you. That's a tough one, ain't it? Somebody might have did something horrible to you. I don't know. As harsh as maybe killing someone. As mad as someone may have uh, looked at you the wrong way. Y'all understand what I'm going with it? But whenever we struggle to forgive, we need to revisit what we were like when God first forgave us. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Ephesians. I'm going to show you something over here in Ephesians that's going to help us out some. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5. It says here that, and he hath quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God. Yes. Somebody say, but God, but God who is rich in mercy yes. for his great love wherewith he loved us. Yes. Even when we were dead in sins he quickened us together with Christ by grace he are saved. So we have to we have to remember where we come from, ain't that right? Yeah. We ain't always been where we are right now, amen? In other words, it tells us that at some time we was a disappointment to God. We was children of wrath at one point, amen? We said one time, it says that you used to live in sin like the rest of the world. Amen? It goes on saying, obey the devil. Can I get a witness? Amen. We have to remember where we come from. Amen. But God forgave us of our most grievous sin. 
and, the, and rebellion against us. He had mercy on us, so we must show mercy for others. Amen? Amen. Romans 5 and 8. Another one that'll help you out. I hope you write these down. Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the first Sunday, ain't that right? We are remembering, amen, around here what he did for us on the cross. Yes, he forgave us, amen. He died for us on that cross. That was God's love toward us right there. And having said this, how we, how can we ever refuse, amen, to forgive those who sin against us? Knowing what I just read to you right here. I'm glad that you all are here today. Because now we are all on the hook. We ain't off the hook no more because we know these verses that we just read in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. Also Romans 5 and 8, amen? There's really no reason why we shouldn't forgive, amen. We can, we can find our own reasons, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later, our own reasons, amen. Now God knew that mankind would struggle, amen. He knew that we would struggle in the area of forgiving others. That's why the Bible gives us so much instruction on it. If you go to look at forgiveness in the Bible, you're going to find a whole lot of instruction on, on, on how to forgive and how we should forgive. Amen? Another one, Ephesians 4.32. God got something for us today. Write this down. Ephesians 4.32. It says, And be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even a God for Christ's sake have forgiven you. Ain't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Church, forgiveness is not a spiritual gift. Some people some people use that, amen. I can't forgive like others. Yes, you can. Amen. Yes, you can. They say forgiveness is, is not a spiritual gift. It's not a skill. It's not an inherited trait. You know, you hear sometimes say, that, that's a nice family. They, they got such a loving heart. Well, forgiveness is not like that, amen. Forgiveness is a choice that we make. Forgiveness is a choice you make. So it's not no gift, skill, or inherited trait or anything like that. Over in Luke chapter 23. In 34, it says that Jesus looked down on those who had ruthlessly mocked him. He looked down on those who had nailed him to the cross, church. Yet he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And again, I say, how can we refuse, amen, to forgive those who sin against us. If Jesus hung down that cross, you know, before then they had marched him from hall to hall. Then they then they took him up on the hill, making him bear his own cross. Amen. They beat him all the way. Blood pouring out of his face and all over him. Amen. Pierce him in the side. After all that spitting on him and all that, treating him all kind of ways, mocking him, he still looked down as he hang on that cross and said, Father, forgive him. He died for the whole world, church. He died for all that we have done wrong, amen? That was a lot on him. Yet and still, he made the choice to forgive. And y'all know that we are supposed to, we, are, we do call ourselves Christian, right? That means we're supposed to follow his lead. If he did it, then we should do it too. That's God's gold standard of forgiveness. 
Jesus said that the measure in which we are forgiven is the same standard we use in, that he used in forgiving us. So, let's look at your life. How do you forgive others? Do you forgive at all? What if somebody cuts you off? You might have a pretty choice word for them, amen? Then you, then you think about it. Holy Spirit, get you. Say, no, nah, you shouldn't do that. Do you go ahead on and forgive that person? Or not? What if somebody lied to you? How good are we forgiving them people lying to us? Cheating on them. Well, then the same measure that you forgive, that's the same measure that God forgives us. Ain't that something? It says there in the book, ain't that right? I'm not making this up, it's there. That's why I gave you all these scriptures so you can, it can bag me up on what I'm saying here. So God, forgiveness is not based on standards that we determine, but on the standard that he established in his word. That's how God's uh, forgiveness works. God allows for no exceptions when it comes to forgiveness. I know it takes some time sometimes. But at some point, you had to go on and let it go. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later on on another day, but forgiveness, unforgiveness, I might say, has caused a lot of uh, health problems. A lot of stress goes on with that. It comes with your package, amen? Unforgiveness. Don't feel good. Depressed. A lot of it because of unforgiveness, amen? God's gold standard of forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. And I like this passage of scripture. Go there with me. Matthew chapter 18. Verses 21 through 22. It says, Then came Peter. I'm going to read to you in the, in the New Living Translation. It says, Then came then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Then Jesus answered, No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Y'all see that in your Bible? So really what Jesus was saying, there's no limit on in which we should ever stop forgiving somebody. Makes, makes no difference the severity of the offense. It's tough, ain't it? But it's the word. Amen? It don't matter if the other person is a believer or not a believer. It's our duty to forgive. That's what Jesus did on that cross. He died for us. Amen? He, he, he forgave us of our sin. It don't matter if that person comes to you and asks for forgiveness or not. We have to do it anyway. It don't matter how long, amen, how long ago the offense occurred. I told you at some point, we got to let it go. We got to let God have it. We got to forgive the offender, amen? The Bible is clear that we must forgive others. I told you our reason for forgiving don't matter to God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. It says there, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowels of merciness, kindness, ominous of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, 
if any man have quarreled against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Y'all see that? This is God's gold standard of forgiveness. Now before you ask God for forgiveness of your own sins, just take a moment and reflect on your relationship with others. I'm going to say it again. Before you ask God for forgiveness of your own sins, take a moment and reflect on your relationship with other people. How you have forgiven other folks. Amen? That have come across your path. Now, would you want God to forgive you in the same way that you have forgave others? Some of us probably say, nah, I don't want God to forgive me because I haven't forgive, forgiven that person for whatever they done, amen, for cutting me off. I haven't forgiven that person for firing me. I haven't forgiven that person for uh, looking at me the wrong way. I haven't forgave that person who cheated on me, amen. Can I get a witness? We just need to remember, church, on what Jesus did for us on Calvary. He died for all of our sins, amen? And he asked God to forgive him for our nailing him to the cross. Can I say that one more time? He asked God to forgive us, amen? For our nailing him to the cross. Yeah, we were there all those people that that was around, amen, and just watched them die, they represent us, amen. And so we have to be big enough, we have to be Christian enough, amen, to forgive others when they wrong us, forgive others, amen, when they spit on us, forgive others when they talk about us. We have to forgive others, church. I tell you what, if you forgive others, you'll live a much peaceful life. If you forgive others, you'll live a much happier life, amen? If you forgive us, amen, a lot of these clouds, amen, will turn to sunshine. God is good, at it? And what I like about God, he's good all of the time. He's good all of the time. We serve a good God. We serve a mighty God. So we have to be we have to be kind to one another. That's what it says there, in the, you know. God chose us, amen, to be for the holy people that he loved. God chose us. Ain't that something? So we have to choose forgiveness. We got to clothe ourselves, amen, with these things, with, with mercy and kindness. We got to be gentle, amen, with one another. And another thing, we got to be patient with one another. And I like what verse 13 says. It says, make allowance for each other's fault. We know that we're going to mess up sometimes, ain't that right? But we need to forgive anybody who offends us, church. It's just as simple as that. If Jesus did it, as they, as they marched him from town hall to town hall, and uh, judgment to judgment, if, if, they, if he forgave, for all of that, all the whippings and things that he that he got for us, if he forgave that uh, the, the spear that was pushing his side where blood and water come streaming down his side, he forgave all of those things. So we must forgive. And because he forgave, amen, somebody go with me to the, to the cross, y'all, because he forgave, remember, he knew that his father was going to raise him up. And say so he hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour. Then he gave up to him. Then they put him in a borrowed tomb. And he stayed there for three days. And on that third day, he got up with all power. Amen. And that power that he got, he issued it to us right now. The Holy Spirit. Amen. Through the Holy Spirit, we can forgive other folks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because, you know, when, when it boils down to it, the 
Holy Spirit is what lead and guide us. And if we, if we be disobedient to the Holy Spirit, then we'll be disobedient to God. Amen. And you know what God, how he described people who disobey him? As being children of wrath. Ain't that something? I don't want to be late for that. But I must, and we must, amen, follow God's gold standard of forgiveness. And we need to know that, church. The door of the church is open right now. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to forgive others, you need to join up now. We don't know the day, the time, nor the hour in which the Lord is going to take us home. You know, we we, we, uh, we ride around every day in, uh, in our cars and things, and uh, even taking a walk to the mailbox. We don't even know we're going to make it back to the house or not. But one thing I do know for sure, that if you have a forgiving heart, if you love Jesus, you will have a resting place for your soul in eternity. God said that when Jesus left, amen, ascended to the heaven, he said that he was going to prepare a place for us. And so, having said that, that place that he's prepared for us is in heaven, amen? So, now is the time, if you don't believe, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. He'll be Lord of your life. That he you believe that he died for all of our sins. Now is the time. And the only way that you're going to see God is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So you have to come through him. God's gold standard of forgiveness. We see that there is none today. We have extended the privilege of the open door of the church. The blood is not required in our hands. Amen. Give God a hand, praise. Amen. If you would like to give to this ministry, and we certainly pray that you will, please um, send Sister Estella Dean a text to 901-831-9224. In that text, include your name. Indicate whether you're giving a tithe or an offering, the amount you wish to give, and your email address. You will receive um, an invoice via email through which you may go in and uh, give your desired amount. If you would like to mail your gift in, please do so. Post Office Box 5207, Holly Springs, Mississippi, 38634. We love you and God bless you.